Joe Jackson is a former NFL football player, and he's an author and a speaker. He knows what it's like to face challenges in his life, but he also knows what it's like to be an overcomer. He's the author of Championship Sunday, and he's my guest here today. I'm Babby Souse. I'm Babby Mason, and Babby Souse is coming to you right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Babby's House, where everybody is a member of the family. I am so glad that you've joined me for today's show. I believe it's going to be an encouraging show for you. My very special guest is Joe Jackson. He's a former NFL football player, but he lives and loves the Lord, and he lives for him, and he's written a great book called Championship Sunday. He's got a great story to tell, and you don't want to miss a single word. So stick around for my guest, Joe Jackson, and a great conversation. But I'm going to kick today's show off with a song that reaches back into the archives and it's a wonderful paraphrase of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and it's called Love is the More Excellent Way. I believe you'll be able to catch on to the chorus. You can sing it with me, all right? I can speak with the tongues of men and But if I don't have love, I'm just a clanging cell.
Welcome back to the show, everyone. I'm Babby Mason, and this is Babby Salson. I'm so happy today to have as a very special guest, Joe Jackson. He is the author of Championship Sunday, and you would recognize his name as a former NFL football player, and we'll get to know a little bit about his background as far as playing, his, uh, playing football. But I love stories like this. I love overcoming stories, uh, particularly of uh, African Americans who have uh, faced challenges in their life, uh, faced challenges like overcoming their past, overcoming Jim Crow laws, and have survived and have become overcomers. They encourage people like me. Their story is a story of a dream that is fulfilled. And uh, I'm just so happy to have Joe Jackson as my guest today. Mr. Joe Jackson, welcome to Babby's house, my friend. Babby, it's Great to be in your house. God bless you. Thank you. Welcome to the house. We're happy to have you. Well, I want to jump right in. Long time fan. Yes. Long time oh, fan. thank you, sir. Listen, thank you. That's my honor to hear you say that. That's amazing. Yeah. Praise God for that. Well, listen, I All want right. to jump right into your story and um, talk to me about your growing up in Cincinnati. And, you know, I read in your book that you, you know, you faced some, some, some challenges as a kid growing up in the neighborhood, and you know that's not an uncommon story growing up in the 60s and during the Civil Rights Movement and having to face, uh, you know, segregation before uh, segregation was outlawed. Talk to me about growing up there. Well, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I came out of a great church and a great family. Uh, had a lot of affirmation from my family that I could make it in life, that I was special in life, that, um, you know, I had a great destiny. And so there's really no excuses, even though Jim Crow and segregation was alive and well, I really have no excuses for the poor choices I made. I made poor choices because um, I think of a low self-esteem, wanted to be like everybody else, wanted to fit in with my friends. I really gleaned on what they felt about me uh, in terms of their approval, in terms of their acceptance of me. So uh, consequently, I made some poor choices and uh, only by the grace of God that I came out of that area, uh, finished high school, went to college, which was unthinkable. And then later on had an opportunity to play in the NFL for about eight years. So it was an incredible journey. And I thank God for everything that happened to me. Uh, but um, I just am so grateful. Yes. Well, you talked about in your book, you talked about how in, during that season for the black family, more black families were more conservative than they are nowadays. Talk about that and how that impacted your life. Well, certainly that did impact my life. I think in general, we were conservative, not only black families, but uh, as a culture, as, an, as a nation. Um, I learned a song called Onward Christian Soldiers, not so much in the church, but in uh, public high school. Wow. So by and large, we were conservative. Um, I think my, my grandmother always told me, I vote Republican, I vote Republican. And uh, candidates that were Republican, they used to put their banners in our front yards all in the neighborhood. So uh, at that particular time, we were indeed politically uh, more, I guess you would say, conservative. Yes. Well, you talked about um, in your book called Championship Sunday, which I have really enjoyed reading, by the way. It's a great book, and thank you for writing it. We'll talk more about that. Um, but talk to me about the fact that, you know, you, you had this troubled past, but things began to change for you, and uh, some lights began to come on. Talk to me about how you began to get a grip on life. Well, let me tell you, first of all, I grew up in the Black Baptist Church, and it was called Second Trinity Baptist Church. I was about 12 years old, and the pastor said, who wants to join the church? My hand went up, and I came forward. And two things happened to me. Number one, I was baptized, and later on, my name was entered on the church roll as a member of Second Trinity Baptist Church. So for the next six and a half years, I, I brought my street attitude, my street carnality into the house of God, and that's all I had because nothing really happened on the inside. All I had was a superficial, razor-thin veneer of Christianity applied to the surface of my life. Well, less advanced about six years. I'm now 18 years old. I'm on the campus of New Mexico State playing football on a football scholarship. I'm walking home from football practice, and a kid named Ken Johnson approaches me, and he says, hey, big man, have you got five minutes? I said, what's the deal, brother? He told me that God loved me. 
And God had a phenomenal plan for my life. And obviously, because of sin, there was a chasm between God and man, but no problem because Jesus was the bridge. I had a praying grandmother. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous grandmother has much power. My grandmother prayed that I'd come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And right there, 1969, I gave my heart to Christ as an 18-year-old freshman at the height of the Jesus movement. And that really was the most significant thing that has ever, ever, ever happened in my life. Yes. I didn't see, I didn't see any lights. I didn't um, hear a voice. I didn't get knocked on my hindquarters. But a seed was planted in my life. And God gradually began to transform my life into the kind of person that uh, wanted me to be from the foundation of the world. So you learn the difference between joining the church and actually having Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Baby, that's so true. You know, <laughs> I never heard so much about accepting Christ. Uh, the invitation I heard was join the church, join the church. So that's what I did. Yeah. Consequently, you can join the church and still not be a part of the family of God. And I discovered that uh, later on when Jesus Christ began to change my life and come into my life and uh, make me uh, the kind of person that he wanted to me to be from the foundation of the world. Amen. That's a beautiful plan. And you, you talked about this encounter that you had with one of your friends in school, and he actually said to you, listen, man, God has a phenomenal plan for your life. And you know that sometimes the, the plan is, you know, it takes us to some, through some challenges, but it also introduces us to the best that God has for us. And God's plan for you led you to the NFL. Talk to us about how that happened. Well, that's so true. It was my dream to play professional football. I didn't know if I was going to get an opportunity to do that, but that was all of our dreams. All of the kids that ran in the neighborhood, we wanted to be some kind of athlete, baseball, football, or basketball. Mine was football. And um, finally, in uh, 1972, I got a call from the New York Jets. Well, first of all, I was told that I was going to be drafted in the first round. I hung around the phone, hung around the phone, first round, second round, third round, <laughs> came by, or the fourth round. I said, man, I'm frustrated. I got my little 64 Corvair, Chevy Corvair. I took a drive to get some, get some fresh air, and I came back on campus, and uh, a kid said, hey, Joey, Joey, that's what they used to call me back then. Joey, that uh, New York has drafted you. I said, New York, who? The Jets or the Giants? I said, the Jets, they got you in the fifth round. I said, you're kidding me. Even though I did not get drafted in the first round or the second round, I tell you, I was so excited that day. A dream fulfilled, a dream finally come true that I was going to get an opportunity to play in the National Football League. Amen. Well, congratulations on that, and congratulations on a great career. And, you know, whenever I talk with football players or, or athletes that have had a professional career in athletes, uh, you know, playing in, on a professional uh, platform and stage, they always talk about lessons that they've learned. <laughs> Were there some, some lessons that you learned as, as a member of a major, a major football team? Well, you know, I had a defensive line coach named Buddy Ryan. He was, he was the architect of the 85 Bears defense. The Bears won the Super Bowl in 85, or rather 1985. And Buddy Ryan was my defensive line coach. And after practice, instead of doing uh, stadium stairs, wind sprints, duck walk, we did something called ups and downs. And we'd have to do ups and downs after two and a half hour practice just for cardio. And sometimes it'd be a hundred of them just down and up, down and up. I learned after I retired because I hated, hated ups and downs to the capital age. I learned life is about ups and downs. There's ups. I mean, if you go to a hospital and you see someone on a monitor, it's up and down, up and down. That's life. If it's like this, you don't want that. That's flat line. You're gone. <laughs> You're gone. Life is about <laughs> ups and downs. You, That's right. You get, you know, you get knocked down and you get back up. So there are many, there are so many, Babby, parallels between what I did on a hundred yard field and what I'm doing now in life as I made the transition to life. So, yes, there are yeah, a lot, lot of lessons. parallels. Yes. Um, you say um, in your book that if you stand for something, be prepared to be considered controversial. What do you mean by that? Jesus stood for something. He said, the, he said, he said um, 
you know, the first you'll be able to ask, he said, if, if, if you don't hate your, in a sense, parent or your father, your mother more than me, you know, if you, you know, and, and he said statements like that with, with sign of being, you know, would kind of be confusing to people. What does he mean? You know, what is he saying? We are to hate our parents, you know, we're, what, what's, what's, you know, but when you make a stand for something, and the world is going one way, and the world is pulling you one way. Yet, yet you're standing for the Lord. You're grounded in the truth. You're grounded in what you believe is right. You're going to be a target. You're going to be a target of question. You're going to be a target of criticism. You're going to be a target of speculation. So, um, Christ was controversial, not because of controversy, but because he lifted up a light in a dark world, and people were drawn to that light. And when you do that, that's going to reveal things that, wow, you know, what's he talking about? You know, what's, you know, what does he mean by that? So basically, that's what I was saying. The first shall be last, the last shall be, it's uh, not, not for the sake of being controversy. Yes. Just being the sake of and being, standing, that's standing right, for standing up for right and righteousness and standing up for Christ. Absolutely. 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 Well, you know, when a lot of young people see football players, they think of big houses, you know, fast cars, uh, high rolling, you know, just living the fast life. Um, but living in the limelight is not all it's cracked up to be. Did, did you figure that out somewhere along the line? Well, that's the lures of uh, success in anything you do, any profession you do, name, game, and fame. Hmm. And that can, that can be pretty alluring. And if you're not grounded in the truth, you can get swept away. My first year, go from Las Cruces, New Mexico, to New York City. And it was important for me to be grounded. I had some great friends on campus that I could go to for prayer, you know, for encouragement. When I get to New York City, it's a different apple. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a different, it's indeed the big apple, but it's a <laughs> yes. different. It's a different <laughs> apple, too. <laughs> Absolutely. So... I had to seek out those people on on the New York Jets who love the Lord, people like Winston Hill, Paul Crane, and Early Thomas, who was my roommate, Christian guys who loved the Lord, who were not only great football players, but knew that they needed something else, something that uh, could sustain them, something that was real. Because in a sense, it's sort of superficial. I, I hate to say that, but it, it really is. You know, all this glitter, all this fame, and, uh, you know, you have to watch yourself. You have to guard yourself because if you don't, you can hang on to these things. And when these things kind of crumble, then you're left with holding absolutely nothing. Yes, so, you're holding on to you nothing. You be grounded. Well, when we come back after this break, we want to hear uh, more about what God is doing in your life. You have established a wonderful ministry. We want to talk with you about that and about what God is doing in your life today. And we're excited that God is using your influence. He is using, as you say, your name, your game, and your fame for his glory. And we're going to talk more about that when we come back here on Babby's House. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. Babby's House will be right back after these messages. Stay with us. Well, I have been enjoying my conversation with Joe Jackson. He is a former NFL football player and the author of Championship Sunday, An Uncommon Pursuit of a Dream. And he is an amazing person living for the Lord. And, he's, and Joe, you have established Joe Jackson Ministries. Tell us what that's about. Well, I'm basically an evangelist, and I travel uh, work where uh, God opens doors for me to preach in churches. I do a lot of men's ministry. Matter of fact, tonight I'm headed to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. I'm doing a men's event there. And uh, so basically work with athletes as well, Athletes International Ministries. We have a big conference here in, in Phoenix where we invite hundreds of athletes and their family members to come and attend. And we have um, music ministry. And so, oh, you know, God has opened up a very... Uh, I guess, door for me, and I, I'm so grateful. The least likeliest person to ever be doing this work. That's least awesome. Likely. So tell us, do you have a family? And tell us about what your what your family life is like. Yeah, uh, I have a wife and a daughter. I didn't get married until I was 53. I don't wow. recommend that. 
uh, but but uh, our waited for the right woman. Her name is Terrell, T E R I L L. Terrell with a T, not Carol. But anyway, we we got married uh, 17 years ago. Well, congratulations. Really worth the wait. Yes, so thank God that's wonderful to hear. Well, you know, when I talk to young people. Uh, and have the opportunity, I serve on a, uh, with a ministry in the Atlanta area for young people. And, you know, they, they're, they're wanting to fulfill their dream. They see bright lights ahead of them. They see a lot of money ahead of them. But if young people are watching today, what advice would you give them to help them fulfill their dreams? Well, just figure out what your dream is and figure out also how to, how to pursue it. I learned a long time ago that God has a plan for your life. God has a destiny. He's given you a DNA. He's given you um, a vision and a, and, and a call upon your life. I'm not saying that you're going to be a pastor involved in any kind of ministry, but um, you, you have a great opportunity to fulfill your destiny. There is no one, no one like you, no one with your DNA, no one with your skill set, God loves you and has a great plan for you. Seek his plan, seek his will, and uh, you'll walk in destiny. You'll walk in fulfillment, and you'll walk in a purpose-filled Amen. life as well. Amen. I love Jeremiah 29, 11 that says, the Lord says to you, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. So amen. that, amen, you can just be encouraged by that today. Well, Joe, tell amen. us how we can get more information about your ministry and where we can find your books. Uh, JoeJacksonMinistries.org. Uh, that's Wonderful. my website. And it's got every, everything there that you need. Very good. Well, thank you for being our guest today here on Babby's House. And the Lord bless you in all that you do, my friend. Lord bless you, Babby. God bless you. Love amen. you. Amen. Love you too, my brother. And the best of everything to you. Well, my dear friend, thank you for watching Babby's House today. It's always our joy to come to you with beautiful music, encouraging words, wonderful guests, and that is what Babby's House is all about. I'll invite you to do me a favor and go to my official website, which is babby.com, first name only, babby.com. And there at babby.com, you'll find all kinds of wonderful resources to encourage you in your faith. You will find beautiful music, the music that I sing here on Babby's House. All of that music is available right there at Babby's House. Com. Wonderful books and resources for women's Bible study, books to encourage you if you're a singer, songwriter, author, or speaker, you're a creative person. I have books there for you, books for women, music and soundtracks and all of those things to encourage you in your faith. Also, right there at Babby.com, you'll see a Listen Live button, and that is the, uh, you click on that Listen Live button, and that will take you right to Babby Mason Radio. And Babby Mason Radio is a wonderful radio station that's online 24 hours a day to encourage you, encourage you with wonderful music, powerful stories, beautiful Bible study programs, all of that to encourage you to live for the Lord. Well, thank you so very much for watching Babby's House today. It's always our prayer that the, you would know the best that God has to offer you. May he bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This is our prayer. You pray for me, all right? And I will be sure to pray for you. Until next time, God bless you and yours. That's my prayer. Bye-bye for now.